Hello everyone and welcome to the Unit 3 and 4 Chemistry um, QCE ATAR Notes July Lecture. Um, so just a little bit about ATAR Notes before we get started. So ATAR Notes um, provides a bunch of free resources to help you optimise your Year 12 results. So we have hundreds of downloadable study notes, um, lectures scheduled throughout the year so that you can learn from the best, um, discussions, um, which include online Q&A, um, videos to provide you with engaging online revision, um, a newsletter which can help you stay in the loop and keep up to date with the latest information, an ATAR calculator to see if you're on track to receive the ATAR that you want to achieve, um, and articles with study strategies and tips to help you achieve your best results and heaps more. So make sure you check out the website. We also have some additional resources, um, and these are all created by elite recent graduates to help you get your best possible results. So these include TuteSmart, which is online tutoring from, re from recent elite year 12 graduates, and this can either be one-on-one -on -one tutoring or group tutoring. Um, there's also the study guides, which are printed, on, um, printed revision materials which um, provide lots of top tips to help you get great marks. And so this includes notes, um, practice questions, and practice exams. And then we have Ed Unlimited, which provides you with hundreds of top study guides all in one online platform. So a little bit of an overview of what we're going to be going through today. Um, so we're going to be looking at analytical techniques, um, the harbour process, the contact process and um, biodiesel and ethanol production and then we'll also um, tie that all in together to discuss the concepts of industrial chemistry. So before we get started we need to have a look at the syllabus and some of the cognitive verbs that we need to focus on. So when we're looking at the concept of analytical techniques um, the main key points from the syllabus that we want to consider are explain how proteins can be analysed by chromatography and electrophoresis. So this is looking at, as, at our main analytical techniques of chromatography and electrophoresis, uh, which are two different ways which proteins can be separated in order to identify their amino acids. And we can see that our key cognitive verb for this learning intention is explain. So this means that you can draw from the knowledge which you have gained by the end of this lecture and then present that into a new method where you can um, convey that knowledge to whoever is marking. Our next um, part of the syllabus which we have is select and use data from analytical techniques including mass spectrometry, x-ray crystallography and infrared spectroscopy to determine the structure of organic materials. So this is going to be discussing the application of our analytical techniques that are mass spectrometry, x-ray crystallography and infrared spectroscopy and when we are using the cognitive verbs of select and use data, um, this is referring to that you are able to be presented with data from the mass spectrometry, x-ray crystallography and infrared spectrometry and you are able to understand this data and um, understand how um, it can then be applied to your understanding. We can also notice that the cognitive verb of determine is present in this as well when it's saying determine the structure of organic materials. And so determine um, as a cognitive verb is going to mean that you can then use that data which you have found to apply it to um, a context and that context being understanding the structure of the organic materials. Our last one for analytical techniques is analyze data from spectra including mass spectrometry um, and infrared spectroscopy to communicate conceptual understanding, solve problems and make predictions.
So again, this is relating back to our mass spectrometry and our infrared spectroscopy as the analytical techniques. Um, but our main cognitive verb for this one is going to be analyze. And then we also need to consider the cognitive verb of communicate. And so first of all, looking at analyzing, analyzing as a cognitive verb means that you are able to be, you're able to observe the data which you are presented with and then make conclusions based on that data um, using scientific knowledge. And then communicate is being able to draw your analyses, your analyses to a conclusion and portray that to the marker. So that's the analytical techniques. Our next one which we need to look at is chemical synthesis. So our first dot point for chemical synthesis is appreciate that chemical synthesis involves the selection of particular reagents to form a product with specific properties. So our key point in this is looking at chemical synthesis and its reagents um, and the formation of products. And then we also want to consider properties. So with this particular learning intention, um, our main cognitive verb is appreciate. And so appreciate as a cognitive verb means that they want you to understand that this is a concept that exists and that um, particular reagents will come together to form products that will have certain properties, but it doesn't go as far, appreciate doesn't go as far as the depth of understand. Um, it's just having a knowledge that it does exist. So that then brings us to our next dot point, which is an understand cognitive verb dot point. And so this one is understand that reagents and reaction conditions are chosen to optimize the yield and rate for chemical synthesis processes, including the production of ammonia in the harbor process, sulfuric acid in the contact, contact process, and biodiesel in the base catalyzed and lipase catalyzed methods. So our main points for this is looking at reagents and reaction conditions for particular processes that will yield um, particular products. And so these being production of ammonia, sulfuric acid, and biodiesel. And so in these, you'll need to understand, and understand is a fairly straightforward cognitive verb. It's just knowing all of the processes that contribute to that particular reaction. And so that's knowing all of the reactants and all of the products of the harbor process, the contact process, and the base catalyzed and lipase catalyzed methods for making biodiesel. That's also having an understanding of the reaction conditions, so that taking in considera into consideration temperature, pressure, and any catalysts used. Our next learning intention um, is understanding that fuels, including biodiesel, ethanol, and hydrogen, can be synthesized from a range of chemical reactions, including addition, oxidation, and esterification. So this is yet again, another understand cognitive verb learning intention. So this is um, meaning that we need to understand all of the reagents that are presented. Um, so that being both the reactants and the products for these particular reactions and also knowing the reaction conditions. So that being the temperature and the pressure. And so that will apply to the reactions which include biodiesel, ethanol, and hydrogen. And then that, um, com that being paired with combining your knowledge of addition, oxidation, and esterification reactions. Our next one is also an understand cognitive verb type learning intention. And so this one is understand that enzymes can be used on an industrial scale for chemical synthesis to achieve an economically viable rate, including fermentation to produce ethanol and lipase catalyzed transesterification to produce biodiesel. So 
This is looking at how we can use catalysts, specifically being enzymes, uh, which are a biological catalyst, um, on large scale chemical production. So this then tying into industrial chemistry concepts um, to achieve um, an economically viable, so um, such that it produces large quantities um, for the least amount of input. Um, and so this is when we specifically consider um, the production of ethanol and the production of biodiesel in terms of fermentation for ethanol and lipase catalyzed processes for biodiesel. And so again, just reiterating that this is an understanding cognitive verb. So you need to have a full knowledge of the processes which go into these reactions, including the, their reagents, so their reactants and products and the reaction conditions, so temperature, pressure, and the catalysts, which in this case will be enzymes. Um, so we've got more for chemical synthesis. So our next one is describe using equations, um, the production of ethanol from fermentation and ethanol from the hydration of ethene. So this one is doesn't go into as much depth as our understand cognitive verbs because it's just describe. So this means you will need to know the reaction conditions um, and you'll need to know both the uh, reactants and the products. So all of the reagents for these. However, it's not as much depth as needing to know the exact reasons as to why certain um, reagents are used and why certain um, catalysts are used. It's more just being able to compare the two and understand how they can relate to green chemistry principles. Our next learning intention is also another described learning intention. And so it is describe using equations, the transesterification of triglycerides to produce biodiesel. Um, and so this is looking at, again, back to almost like that last dot point in the previous column with um, understanding the biodiesel. However, this is, this is just um, on a more surface level as it's just a describe learning intention. Um, and it's talking about using equations to write out the transesterification of triglycerides to produce biodiesel. So you won't need to know how to explain these. You'll just need to know to write out the um, equation for these. Our next one is discuss using diagrams and relevant half equations, the operation of a hydrogen fuel cell under acidic and alkaline conditions. So this is a discuss cognitive verb, which means that it goes on the level of understand um, but also requires that little bit of extra knowledge where you can um, put more input into your answer and discuss um, comparisons between them. So these are talking about where we have an acidic or, or an alkaline hydrogen fuel cell. And so these have differing half equations um, depending on their conditions, so the acidic or alkaline. And so this means that with discuss, um, you're able to put forward um, an understanding of this, but also do a comparison of them as well. Um, finally, we have calculate the yield of chemical synthesis reactions by comparing stoichiometric quantities with actual quant quantities and by determining limiting reagents. So this one has a couple of cognitive verbs present in it. Um, so we've got calculate, and we've got compare. So calculate is fairly straightforward. It's just being able to do the correct calculations um, for finding out these stoichiometric quantities and being able to calculate the limiting reagents. Um, and so that also ties in with the determine. So calculate and determine tie in quite well together. Um, whereas calculate's very, calculate's very straightforward as to finding the actual number, um, determine, might require you to calculate and then apply what you what you know to that calculation to then 
figure out what the limiting reagent is going to be. And then compare is just going to be taking two different um, stoichiometric quantities to then figure out which one is then the limiting reagent. So that summarizes all of our syllabus and cognitive verbs that will, that will be required for what we're looking at today. So now we'll go on to looking at um, some analytical techniques. And so these are the techniques which are used to um, identify various different compounds and molecules in chemical applications. So the first one we're gonna be looking at is chromatography. And so with chromatography, we have many different types of chromatography. Um, so we're going to be starting off with looking at thin layer chromatography. So as we can see on the screen here, we have a diagram that represents thin layer chromatography. So basically thin layer chromatography is our most common type of chromatography, which we look at in the QC syllabus and in this particular um, type of calculations which you would want to be doing. Um, so basically what thin layer chromatography does is, thin layer chromatography um, uses a solid stationary plate, um, solid stationary phase, which is known as a plate. So that's what can be seen um, where those dots are traveling up. And it uses a liquid mobile phase, which is a solution which is placed in the bottom of the beaker. So we can see that on the screen there where the light blue color is seen to be the solid stationary phase, which is the plate and the surrounding gray area, which the plate is placed in is the liquid mobile phase, which is obviously our solution in the beaker. And so in thin layer chromatography, molecules in the thin layer chromatography are separated on the basis of polarity. And so this uses capillary action um, in which the liquid phase is slowly moving upwards through the solid phase. So in order to do this, um, you need to have a line drawn about one centimeter from the bottom of the solid phase. And at this um, line, which is drawn from one centimeter at the bottom of the solid phase, you want to add a small dot of your sample. And so typically that sample will be um, a hydrolyzed protein sample, so where you've taken an unknown protein and you've broken it down in a hydrolysis reaction into its separate amino acids. And so when you break it down into its separate amino acids, those amino acids will be able to be separated through this thin layer chromatography. And so basically you add a small dot of this sample um, on that one centimeter line and you can do multiple different samples along the line as long as they are far enough away from each other that they're not going to be mixing together. And then basically what happens is as the mobile phase is pulled up through the plate through capillary action, so because there's fine um, little pores through the solid phase, um, the liquid can be pulled up through the beaker um, the sample which you've put onto that one centimeter on the stationary phase um, is pulled up along as well um, and at different rates depending on the polarity of each of those different molecules. And so basically if the sample contains multiple different molecules that have different polarities they'll be separated because those molecules are gonna be pulled at different speeds. And so that's going to be fully dependent on the polarity of the liquid mobile phase. So if the liquid mobile phase is polar, then the polar um, molecules in the sample will be more attracted to the liquid phase. Whereas if it is a nonpolar, then the nonpolar components of the sample will be more attracted to the liquid mobile phase. And so this is going to cause that difference in speeds at which they are moved through the sample and will thus separate them as we can see here in the diagram where we've got all of these colored dots which have traveled in different, um, different distances.
And so once the mobile phase, so that sample which we had in our beaker, which didn't have the proteins in it, the one which was used as our solvent, um, once that has reached the top of the stationary phase, the plate gets removed, so our stationary phase gets removed from the solution. And so now we need to measure the distance between the one centimeter line drawn at the bottom and the highest point on the mobile phase that has been reached, as well as the distance between the line and each dot that's seen along the length of the plate or each dot from the sample, which we see along the plate. And so when you divide, we can see here we've got this um, We've got this um, calculation which we can do here, which is called the retention factor or RF factor, uh, which we can calculate. And so this can give us a value which can make us understand um, a constant for any particular molecule. And so we can um, divide the distance traveled by the component, divided by the distance traveled by the mobile phase or by the solvent, um, and so this will give us the retention factor. And so our retention factor is going to be constant for any particular molecule, which means that no matter what protein it is, if it always has one of the same amino acid in it, that one particular amino acid will always result in the same retention factor. And so this allows us to then determine unknown proteins in a sample um, and hence is very useful for identifying unknown solutions. So that's thin layer chromatography. Our next one we're going to be looking at is called column chromatography. And so column chromatography um, goes on the basis of a similar concept where we have basically the reverse of thin layer chromatography. So the solid phase is the column packed with silica beads and they're going to be acting the same way as our solid phase in the thin layer chromatography. And then the liquid phase um, is mixed in with the sample and is added to the top so that it can all flow down through the column. So flowing down through all of those silica beads um, and basically the samples will then, yet again, be separated out based on their polarity. And so what we'll notice in this is that the molecules with the stronger interactions with the silica will flow through the column more slowly when we open the bottom of the column. Um, and so this will mean that um, we can physically separate out the molecules from other molecules um, that have different properties, and we can then use those for different tests to further analyze them and determine what they are. And so often this is done when we have a sample that has a number of various different chemicals in it, and when we're only interested in determining one or a few of those particular chemicals. So if there's particular um, components in there which we completely want to disregard, then we may use this concept of column chromatography. This means that we can then get a more pure sample of the chemical of interest. Um, and then we can then go on to use these samples for more specific analyses, or we can test them to then determine different properties about the chemicals, which we may, which we may then use to determine their nature. And so that's column chromatography. Um, so our next one we want to look at is known as gas chromatography. And so gas chromatography is a lot less commonly used um, just because it's a lot more of a complex process as we can see from this diagram here. So with gas chromatography, um, it uses a lot of computerized techniques and changes in pressure to help us determine um, unknown compounds or unknown substances. So in gas chromatography, um, the samples are vaporized and with the help of a carrier gas, 
so often that will be like hydrogen or nitrogen, um, it gets forced through a detector, which is like what we can see in this section over here. And so a beam of light is then used, um, and this is shone at the sample through this section in here. And basically what happens is when the light is shone through this sample, we can then measure the light which is being absorbed by the sample um, and the measure and measure how much light is being reflected as well. And so molecules with a lower boiling point are going to come out of the machine first um, and molecules with a higher boiling point will come out of the machine last. And so basically this is just separating molecules on the basis of their boiling point. And as we know, boiling point is correlated with polarity um, is because it's correlated with intermolecular forces. Um, and so, and this can also then provide us with a pretty accurate representation of concentrations of each separate um, molecule as well. And so that's just because we are fully separating them out. And so because each molecule is going to have a distinct um, boiling point, we can then determine that there's a larger quantity or a smaller quantity of each specific one being produced. So that is gas chromatography, and that sums up all of our main chromatography techniques which we need to know. So the chromatography techniques which we need to know, remembering our thin layer chromatography, so that is our most common type. So that was our first one which we looked at. Our next one which we looked at um, is used a bit less commonly, and so that is column chromatography. And so that was separating it using the silica. And then our final one which we looked at was gas chromatography. And this one is used a lot more in industrial settings and in large laboratory situations um, and is very reliable um, and can tell us a lot about concentration, but is obviously a lot more difficult process to carry out as it, can, as it requires a lot of more equipment and um, computerization. So now we'll go on to look at electrophoresis. And so if you've been doing biology as well, um, you may be familiar with the concept of electrophoresis as a technique that um, is used in DNA testing. So for those of you who don't already know, gel electrophoresis is a technique which is used to separate DNA fragments or other macromolecules that are made of proteins such as RNA or just any other general proteins um, based on their size and charge. And so basically in electrophoresis, um, it involves running a current through a gel containing molecules of interest. And so based on their size, charge and polarity, the molecules will travel through the gel at different speeds and in different directions. And so this enables them to be separated from one another um, in the sequence of base pairs. So we can see along here, um, if this is specifically DNA, we can see that these fragments have been produced um, as they each have different base pair lengths for each different um, fragment of DNA. And so gel electrophoresis um, involves a gel, which is a slab of jelly-like material in which the electrophoresis process is carried out through. And so the gels for DNA separation are typically made out of a polysaccharide, which we know as agar-rose gel. And so this agar-rose gel um, comes as dry powdered flakes and so basically when the agar rose is heated um, in a buffer, so a buffer being water with some salts in it um, to provide or uh, to contribute to the polarity um, movement, um, and then it's allowed to cool, it forms a solid, um, slightly squishy gel, 
And so basically this gel is going to form like a platform in which we can carry out this electrophoresis process on. And so at one end, the gel is going to have these pocket-like indentations, which are called wells. And so these are where the DNA samples are going to be placed. And so basically this is produced by once the agar rose gel has been made into a liquid, it gets poured over onto the electrophoresis plate. And then what we call a comb um, is placed at the top of the plate. And so once the gel has been set, um, this can then be removed, which is then what creates these wells where the DNA can be pipetted into. And so before the DNA samples have been added to these wells, the gel needs to be placed into what's known as a gel box. And so this box um, has electrodes on it. And so one end of the box is going to be connected to a positive electrode. And the other end is going to be connected to a negative electrode. And then the main body of the box, um, where the gel is going to be placed, is going to be filled with a salt containing buffer solution that's able to conduct current. And so remember, this is because we're separating um, DNA fragments or macromolecules, RNA proteins, based on their size and charge. So if we're doing this based on charge, we need to have something that conduct that can conduct current that the DNA can sit in, as well as these electrodes um, that will either attract or repel the charged, partially charged DNA or proteins. And so once the gel is in the box, um, each of the DNA samples that we want to examine are going to be transferred into one of the wells. And so we'll have one well which is specifically reserved for a DNA ladder. And so a DNA ladder is very important and it needs to be used in any time that electrophoresis is done. Um, and that's because the DNA ladder is a standard reference that contains DNA fragments of known lengths. So this means that we can use the DNA fragments of known lengths to compare with our DNA fragments of unknown lengths so we can then determine what their lengths are. Um, so then the power to the gel box is turned on and as the current flows through the gel from the electrodes, um, the DNA molecules, because they're partially negatively charged due to the phosphate groups in their sugar phosphate backbone, they're gonna start moving through the matrix of the gel through, so through that agar rose gel um, where they've been put into the wells and they'll move away from the wells and towards the positive pole or where we have connected the positive electrode because remember if DNA has partial negative charge it will be attracted to something that is positively charged. And so shorter pieces of DNA are going to travel through the pores of the gel matrix a lot faster than the larger pieces of DNA and so this is just because obviously because they are smaller um, they're able to move much more quickly as they don't have as much resistance against them. And so this means that after the gel has been running for a while the shortest pieces of DNA are going to be closest to the positive end of the gel whilst the longest pieces of DNA will remain near the wells or near the negative electrode. And so basically, as we can see on this um, diagram here, we can see that we've got um, the power supply where we plug it in. We've got the negative electrode, which is up near where the wells are situated, where we put the DNA in. And then we have the positive electrode, which is at the opposite end of the electrophoresis tank and that is where the DNA will be attracted to. And so we can see that the direction of movement corresponds with that, in that it's going to be moving from the negative electrode to the positive electrode and through the buffer solution. So that summarizes um, electrophoresis. So now we're going to go on to look at X-ray crystallography. So, X-ray crystallography 
um, we can see here on the screen is a concept in which we can determine the arrangement of atoms in a crystalline solid um, in three-dimensional space. So this, te this technique um, takes advantage of interatomic spacing of most crystalline solids. So because we know most crystalline solids, they're going to have this spacing arrangement, um, which is either equally um, dispersed or um, more randomly dispersed. And so um, it uses them as a, um, takes advantage of this interatomic spacing of most crystalline solids and uses that as a diffraction gradient for X-ray light. And so this is gonna have wavelengths on the order of one angstrom, which is 10 to the power of negative eight centimeters. And so when light um, encounters this obstacle, um, being parts of the molecule which don't have the gaps through it, um, diffraction is going to occur. And so this means that waves of light are either going to bend around the obstacle or in the case of gaps or little slits within the um, crystalline solid, the light will travel through. And so this results in a diffraction pattern. And so this diffraction pattern um, shows areas of constructive interference, which basically just means where two waves are interacting in phase, so either colliding or moving away from each other, um, and destructive interference, which is where two waves are, act, are interacting out of phase. And so diffraction of an X-ray beam is going to occur when the light interacts with the electron cloud of surrounding atoms of the crystalline solid. So in those parts of the crystalline solid where there is not the gaps, um, it will bounce off the electrons, resulting in different movements of the um, electron beams. So you have a central, as we can see in this diagram here, you can see the central X-ray beam is being directed at the crystallized molecule. Um, but then we have the diffracted rays going off at many different points. And so this is as a result of the X-ray beam passing through the crystallized molecule and being bounced off the electrons to go in different directions and also just being passed straight through the molecule at specific points where there is no electrons. And so basically as the X-ray beam hits the surface of the crystal at a particular angle, some of the light's going to be diffra diffracted at that exact same angle away from the solid. And so we can see that with this central line which goes straight through the middle. However, the remainder of that light is just going to be traveling straight into the crystal and it will re, um, interact with the second plane of atoms within the, within the crystallized molecule. And so some of the light's going to be diffracted at um, particular angles, whilst others will travel deeper into the solid and just be absorbed as opposed to being diffracted. And so the crystallized molecule is then rotated whilst this process is done to achieve a 3D understanding of the crystalline solid. And so this means that it's then pro uh, this process is then repeated for many different planes of the crystal so that we can then get that 3D structure. And so we can see um, on this diagram on the far right here, this is the type of picture which might be produced from an X-ray crystallography um, process. And we can see down the bottom here that this summarizes our process where we have the um, crystallized molecules. And then once the X-rays are diffracted through, we can see the diffraction um, pattern begins to form and it goes through many different phases um, where we can then look at the electron density map. So we can determine where the highest concentration of electrons are in the molecule. And then we can do the fitting process in which we then um, shape that to form an atomic model and hence an understanding of what the crystallized molecule is. So that summarizes X-ray crystallography. So now we're going to look at
the concept of infrared spectroscopy. So infrared spectroscopy, as we can see here, um, is this complex process where we have um, detection of a sample which goes through this machine here. And basically what we produce from this is some wavelengths of absorbance, which we can then use to determine what um, a particular molecule is. And so with infrared spectroscopy, um, basically what we can understand from this is that if you shine infrared light onto a molecule, it's possible for that molecule to absorb some of the light. Um, but the energy that absorbed is going to cause the bond in that particular molecule to stretch and then the whole molecule is going to have more energy because the infrared light is providing energy to that molecule and so causing that stretch um, and then the parts of the molecule are going to try and pull away from each other due to that energy input which has been put into that molecule. And so when the infrared light is shone onto the molecule, it's absorbing the energy. And then when the energy is absorbed, the molecules on either side of the bond um, are basically just being pulled apart and stretching out like much like a spring or when you pull a spring away from each other and it becomes stretched out like this. And so we don't just want to shine one length, uh, wavelength um, of infrared light at our sample. Um, so we actually shine a range of different frequencies and um, that provides us with then our absorbance diagram. And so different bonds, that being like single bonds, double bonds, triple bonds, and also considering bonds between different types of atoms. So whether that be a carbon to a double bonded oxygen in the case of a carbonyl group, or whether that just be a carbon to a hydrogen, or whether it be something like um, an O to H bond, like a hydroxyl group. Um, but all of these different bonds between different molecules um, are going to have different frequencies of light which they can absorb, and so different extents to which they can then be stretched out. And so you can tell which frequencies are gonna be absorbed by comparing it to the graphs um, which we have here so like for example one of these types of graphs here and so this shows the percentage absorbance of the different wavelengths which are of light which are being put onto um, the particular molecule and so this provides us with these different regions um, in our graph which is produced and so um, these different regions um, can basically tell us where um, we have like peaks. And so these peaks are gonna be where the absorbance is much higher or where the absorbance is much lower. And so that's gonna tell us which particular wavelength is most highly absorbed in that particular molecule. And so if we're looking at this particular one here, we can see that we have two different regions. And so we've got our main diagnostic region which we look at over here and so that's this what we call the functional group region and so the functional group region that's where you'll be looking at when you want to identify a particular molecule um, and then we also have the fingerprint region and so the fingerprint region is highly variable depending on molecules and so it's not often studied as it's hard to actually um, analyze the data from the fingerprint region easily and use that to put forward to determine what the functional groups are that are actually present. So we typically focus on the functional group region or the diagnostic region instead. And so an important thing to note with this is that on page 14 of your data booklet, um, there is a very important um, table which tells you about different types of bonds um, and different types of molecules that those bonds are in um, and tells you the number of wavelength that that will have a peak for. 
So for example, we can see here the C to double, bond, double bonded oxygen or the carbonyl group, which is something which we notice in carboxylic acids, um, in ketones and in aldehydes is um, going to be present in this wavelength here at about 1500. And so we can see that in the data booklet as well um, as being a specific diagnostic point where we can find um, these carbonyl groups and identify them on one of our infrared spectroscopy graphs. Same with our C to H bond. Um, however, we will actually have variations for C to H bonds depending on the rest of a molecule. So that's infrared spectroscopy. Um, this gives us a little bit more information about infrared spectroscopy, just by providing us with some more examples. So we can see here we've got a decane molecule um, on the left here. And so decane we know is a 10 carbon long alkane. And so we can say we, we particularly have this peak here. And so if we were to look in the data booklet, we would see that this corresponds with a C to H bond um, type arrangement. And so we only have the C to H bonds and C to C bonds in decane. And so those would be our only peaks that would be present in this particular molecule. And we can see that this is particularly prominent due to this being quite a long alkane molecule. We can also see we have this one here, which is octine 1 or oct 1 ine or 1 octine, whatever you want to call it. And so we know this molecule has eight carbons long and it is an alkyne molecule. And so it's an alkyne on the first carbon. Um, so we know it's got a triple bond at some point. So we can see we've got a wavelength here for a C to H. We also have a wavelength for a triple bond between a carbon and a carbon, which would then distinguish this from being a general alkane molecule to being an alkyne molecule. And then this is just a good little thing for understanding um, the infrared spectroscopy peaks. So we know that a smooth kind of dip is gonna be an alcohol, um, one that's more pointy um, with a double point is going to be something characteristic of a primary amine. Um, a single point is going to be a secondary amine or a terminal alkyne. Um, and then this jagged downward spread out shape that kind of looks like a beard is a sign for a carboxylic acid. And so you don't specifically need to remember these shapes too much. Um, I just find that these are quite helpful just to have familiarity with what these shapes are because there can be a little bit of overlap in directions where you might not know if something's wave number is corresponding to one or another type of um, bond. And so these types of shapes can really help you determine that if you're not sure. So that's infrared spectroscopy. Um, here's just a few more examples which we can see here. So we can see those different shapes where we've got some weak peaks and we've got some um, stronger peaks. And so it just shows where some of the weak peaks can be more new, um, it can be quite useful um, as they have um, differences where they can, can be used to compare. So now we're going to look at mass spectrometry. And so it's important to remember that, that um, infrared spectroscopy and mass spectrometry are two completely different processes. And so mass spectrometry is actually a different process in which we're putting in a vaporized sample to be ionized and then deflected at different rates and different angles to determine what um, we have present in a particular molecule or a particular compound. And so we can look at mass spec to determine how we figure out um, all these different isotopes which might be present. So we, and we can also use this to determine relative abundance 
um, of each different isotope for each different element. And so a sample containing the atoms or molecules of interest um, gets injected into this instrument, which we call a mass spectrometer. And so the sample um, will typically be in an aqueous or organic solution, and it is then immediately vaporized as soon as it's put into this system. And so it's vaporized by this heater, and then the vaporized sample is going to be bombarded by many high energy electrons. And so by bombarding it with these electrons, um, these electrons have the basically have enough energy to look um, to knock electrons off the sample, um, and this creates positively charged ions because remembering electrons are negatively charged. So if I'm removing electrons, we're taking away negativity from a neutral molecule, thus making it more positively charged. And so these ions are then accelerated through electric plates, and this subsequently then results in deflection by a magnetic field, which we can see occurs through this part of the mass spectrometer here. And so then the amount that each ion is deflected by is going to depend on the speed at which it's been accelerated by and also its charge. So ions that move more slowly will be heavier ions. Um, and so these are going to be deflected a lot less because they're heavier ions, it's harder to speed them up and deflect them. Whilst ions that move more, more quickly are going to be the lighter ions, and so they're going to be deflected more because obviously it's going to require less energy to deflect the lighter ions. And so this means that um, the amount by which each ion is deflected is going to be inversely proportional to its mass to charge ratio, um, which we display as m slash z, where m is equal to the mass of the ion and z is obviously equal to its charge. And so when we do mass spectrometry, we end up producing a graph which looks something like this. And so this is an example for zirconium, and it's a zirconium isotope pattern where we can see we've got relative intensity um, across um, compared with mass to charge ratio. And then on this side over here, we've also got isotope abundance. And so typically we're looking at this axis over here of isotope abundance and this axis here of mass to charge ratio. And so we can see for zirconium, the most common isotope of zirconium um, is, uh, is zirconium-90 at 51.45%. Um, then we've also got some of these other isotopes of zirconium. So we've got zirconium-91, zirconium-92, zirconium-94, and zirconium-96. However, we can see these are a lot less prevalent and a lot less abundant than our isotope of zirconium-90, um, so we can generally assume that zirconium-90 is our most common isotope um, at a general level. We can also use mass spectrometry for a lot more complex molecules, so looking at some of our organic compounds. So for example here, we've got this molecule, which is a pentane molecule. And so we can put pentane through a mass spectrometer and we can separate it out um, and that will give us a base peak and a molecular ion peak. And so what this does is this is separating out um, our molecule and breaking it off into different chunks. So we know we could break it off um, at any point along this molecule and it's separating it into different fragments. And so this can help us determine uh, what a sample of an unknown sample is and what molecule it may be because we've broken it into different fragments and so each molecule is going to have different fragments due to having different structures and so then we can use those fragments and the different structures of those fragments um, to determine what the molecule is that is present and also using 
this mass to charge ratio to determine the size of the fragments and hence the maximum size of the molecule which can be present. So we're now going to go on to the concepts of chemical synthesis and design. So this is where we discuss more about um, our different processes, um, which we then relate to industrial chemistry. So first of all, we'll start off with the harbour process. So the harbour process was created by Fritz Harbour. Um, and basically it's a process for making nitrogen, uh, so for making ammonia using nitrogen and hydrogen. And so the harbour process is combining um, nitrogen, atmospheric nitrogen from the air with hydrogen, which has been mainly derived from natural gases like methane, and we're combining these to make ammonia. And so this reaction is a reversible reaction and it's also an exothermic reaction. And so it's important to note um, that this is a reversible reaction. So we can apply concepts of Le Chatelier's principle and also concepts um, surrounding that, um, adding in more reactant to then produce more product and our changes with reaction conditions in order to optimize our production of ammonia. So it's really important to note what our reaction conditions are for this because these are examinable concepts. So first of all, we want to talk about the catalyst for the conditions. So the catalyst is actually slightly more complicated than your typical catalyst for this reaction. So we use an iron catalyst um, to speed up the reaction because this is obviously adding surface area to the reaction. And if you have a greater surface area, the rate of reaction is going to be greater. And so that's really important in this process because nitrogen and hydrogen are both gases. Ammonia is also a gas. And so it's hard to have greater surface area with a gas. So we then got to use a solid catalyst in order to add that surface area. But it's a lot more complex than just using typical um, pure iron solid. So it actually has um, potassium hydroxide added to it as a promoter. And so what a promoter does is it's just a substance which increases its efficiency. And so it's typically using magnetite, which is Fe3O4, um, fused with potassium oxide so K2O, or aluminium oxide, which is Al2O3, or in some cases, um, calcium oxide, uh, which is CaO, um, and then that's put into a very fine powder, um, and obviously putting it into a fine powder is going to maximize that surface area, and so maximizing that surface area is going to greatly increase its availability to then catalyze the reaction. Um, so next we need to discuss the pressure which is used for this reaction. So the pressure is going to vary from each different manufacturing plant to another um, based on their budget for um, their reaction conditions. Um, however, it's always going to be a high pressure. So when we use the pressure for this one, um, it's typically going to be around 200 atmospheres and so the reason that we would use a high pressure for this reaction is because um, you want to have a maximum pressure for the reaction because it's better that we have four moles of reactant um, and only two moles of product so that you can then compare this back all the way to Le Chatelier's principle and so if you compare this back to Le Chatelier's principle um, you can recall that if we increase the pressure, the reaction is going to move to whichever direction minimizes the total pressure. And so this is going to be the side of the reaction with the least moles of gas overall. And so this means that if we increase the pressure, 
we're going to force the reaction to proceed from left to right because we've got um, we can see we've got four moles of gas in the reactants so one mole from the nitrogen one mole from the hydrogen oh, sorry, three moles from the hydrogen and then on the right side of the reaction we only have two moles coming from the ammonia and so if we increase the pressure it's going to force our reaction in the forward direction to produce the least moles of gas because in high pressure there's less space for that gas to uptake. And so you might think, well, if we're going to go for 200 atmospheres to greatly improve that production of ammonia, why don't we just go higher? Why don't we just push it to 500 atmospheres? Why don't we make it a thousand atmospheres? And so we could, but it's all to do with practicality. And so that's because if we increase the um, pressure, we do force the reaction to proceed left to right. However, we know that high pressure systems are gonna be much more reactive, which you may think that sounds good. We want the reaction to occur more, but it will, if we increase the pressure too much, um, it's going to be substantially more reactive and thus incredibly dangerous. And so it can actually be substantially more dangerous than even manufacturing explosives um, and particularly considering since we're producing ammonia, which is commonly used in explosives as well, um, systems like these under too high pressure um, are likely to be highly explosive. And so if anything within the high pressure sim, um, system is compromised, it can then result in a very, very large explosion. Um, so there's quite a fine line between keeping high pressure for efficiency and a low pressure for safety. So that's the main reason which you wouldn't go above 200 atmospheres. There's also obviously the concept of cost. So it's quite expensive to keep something as at a very high pressure because obviously they need to put more energy into the system in order to maintain that high pressure for the reaction. And so if that reaction system is at too high pressure, they're obviously putting in a lot more energy into the system, which is gonna be costing them more in electricity. And obviously the purpose of this process is to be producing ammonia for um, an industrial purpose to be sold. And so they don't want it to cost them more to produce the ammonia than they can sell it for. So um, the next thing we need to consider um, with ammonia is the concept of recycling. So with ammonia, um, we can basically recycle this as it goes through um, to make the process a lot more efficient. So at each pass of the gas through the reactor, only about 15% of this nitrogen here um, and the hydrogen combined is able to be converted into ammonia. So it's a fairly low yield um, for the amount which you put in. Um, this is obviously going to vary from production system to production system, but generally it's around 15%. But with continual recycling of the unreacted nitrogen and hydrogen, so continually taking it out and putting it back in, the overall conversion um, rate becomes about 98%. So we can see that by recycling the nitrogen and the hydrogen back through the system, um, we greatly increase that efficiency and overall conversion rate of the reaction. Thus making it a bit more environmentally conscious and also um, just increasing the efficiency and the cost effectiveness for the production of this process because 15% is quite um, a low production rate whilst 98% is quite high. The next thing we need to consider is the proportions of nitrogen and hydrogen used in the system. So we can see the mixture of nitrogen and hydrogen um, in the reaction is a ratio of one to three. And so the mixture of nitrogen and hydrogen going into the reactor is going to be one volume of nitrogen to three volumes of hydrogen because we know about Avogadro's law. And so Avogadro's law says that equal volumes of gases um, are going 
at the same temperature and the same pressure are going to contain equal numbers of molecules. And so basically, um, we know that this means that the gases which are going into the reactor in the ratio of um, the gases that are going into the reactor are going to be in the ratio of one molecule of nitrogen to three molecules of hydrogen. And so that's basically the proportion which is demanded by the reaction. So if we were to put in more nitrogen, it would be limited by the amount of hydrogen which we've put in. So there's no use putting more nitrogen into the system. Conversely, if we put more hydrogen into the system, it would be limited by the amount of nitrogen which is in the system. And so in some reactions, you might choose to use an excess of one of the reactants. Um, and so you would do this if it's particularly important to use up one, um, one of the particular reactants, like if you want to use up as much as possible of one of the other particular reactants. And so this may be if one of the reactants was particularly more expensive than the other, and the other was relatively inexpensive. However, this doesn't apply in this case of this particular reaction. So we need to just make sure that they're in their molar ratios for the reaction. Um, there's also always a downside to using anything other than, equa than the equation proportions. And so if you have an excess of one reactant, there will be molecules which will be passing through the reactor, which can't possibly react because they're in excess. So there's nothing for them to react with. And so this is wasting reactor space and particularly space on that surface of the catalyst. And so you don't want to be wasting the space on the surface of the catalyst because you then slow down the rate of reaction and the reaction won't be as efficient as you were hoping for it to be. Also, it's very important to ideally remove all of the products and continually add reactants as the reaction progresses. And so we know that we can relate that back to Le Chatelier's principle, because if we are consistently taking out our ammonia product, remember if we're lowering the concentration, which is taking the ammonia out, it will force our reaction in the forward direction. We also know that if we're putting nitrogen and hydrogen in, we're increasing the reaction of the reactants and so increasing um, or increasing the concentration of our reactants. And so if we increase the concentration of the reactants, we're going to force the reaction in the forward direction. And so if we force the reaction in the forward direction, um, we're doing that sort of doubly by taking product out and um, putting reactant in. And so that's going to then maximize the rate of that forward reaction. The next thing we need to consider is the temperature for this reaction. So this is to do with equilibrium considerations, first of all. So you need to shift the position of equilibrium as far possible to the right in order to maximize the possible amount of ammonia in the equilibrium mixture. So the forward reaction, uh, which is producing ammonia, um, is an exothermic reaction. And so we remember with Le Chatelier's principle, um, this will be favoured um, in this particular reaction because it's exothermic if you lower the temperature. And that's because we know in an exothermic reaction, heat is produced, so it's considered like a product. So if we are lowering the temperature, it would be like taking products out of the system Thus, if we were to take ammonia out of the system, we know the reaction would proceed in the forward direction. So if we're taking product, being heat, out of the system by making it colder, we then force the reaction in the forward direction to then produce more product as the reaction sees it to be same as removing product from the system. So it wants to re-attain that equilibrium. Um, so basically, if we lower the temperature, we'll favour the forward direction. And so in order to get as much ammonia as possible, we need the lowest possible temperature as possible. However, that then 
conflicts with considering rate of reaction and kinetic energy of the reaction. So we want to use a temperature of around 400 to 450 degrees Celsius. And so you may be thinking that is a very high temperature and that you would consider that to be too hot for it to be considered to be a low temperature to maximize the rate of the forward reaction. However, in industrial processes, um, extremely warm temperatures and extremely hot temperatures are often used in order to maximize the rate of reaction. Because we know when we consider rate of reaction, the lower the temperature you use, the slower the reaction becomes. Because when you put a lower temperature, the rate of um, the kinetic energy in the reactant molecules decreases so those molecules are moving a lot slower and so they're going to be less likely to collide um, at the correct orientation and at or above the activation energy in order to produce the required products. So if the manufacturer is trying to produce as much ammonia as possible per day, it makes no sense to try and achieve an equilibrium um, mixture which contains a very high proportion of ammonia if it's going to take several years for that equilibrium to be reached because the temperature is so low. And so you need the gases to reach the equilibrium within a very short amount of time so that they'll be in contact with the catalyst in the reactor. And so in this case we use an industrial low temperature which is 400 to 450 degrees Celsius um, but we still want that to be what we consider a fairly high temperature in order to maximize the rate of reaction. And so our compromise is 450 degrees or 400, between that 400 to 450 degrees Celsius because it's producing a reasonably high proportion of ammonia um, in the equilibrium mixture, um, even if it's only going to be 15%. And so um, we also need to then finally consider um, the economic considerations for this as well. So with the economic considerations, um, very high pressures are expensive to produce. Um, and you have to build obviously extremely strong pipes and containment vessels to withstand that. And so that's going to increase the capital costs when it's built. So the high pressures are gonna cost a lot to maintain and so obviously they're going to go for a high pressure for the system, but obviously not too high. So they obviously the compromise for that is 200 atmospheres. So um, finally, we're just going to sum up by talking about uh, what the harbour process is, um, just to give a bit of a background and a bit of the uses of what the harbour process is used for. So the harbour process um, was began with the use of manufacturing for explosives during the war um, and so previously um, nitrogen had been considered to be a very stable molecule however they found that when you add um, hydrogen to this um, in a ratio of one to three um, and you use a catalyst um, you can produce this very highly reactive material, and so that being ammonia. And so this was then, um, this was then obviously adapted um, in future use to then be used now for fertilizers um, and has basically ensured that the Western world can produce much of its farming um, in its farmland areas. So that's basically the harbour process and the production of ammonia. So now we'll go on to talking about the contact process. So the contact process um, we can identify is the production of making sulphur dioxide. And so it does this by converting sulphur dioxide um, into sulphur trioxide. And so this is like our main reversible reaction, which is at the heart of the process. Um, and it can then also convert 
sulfur trioxide than into the sulfuric acid, which will be highly concentrated. So it's mainly like a two step process um, in which we first have to start off with sulfur dioxide to sulfur trioxide and then after sulfur trioxide going into sulfur, um, the concentrated sulfuric acid. So our first step um, is making the sulfur dioxide um, in order to start off with that. And so it's almost then becomes like a three step process. So to start off with, we got to make the sulfur dioxide, which is done either by burning sulfur in an excess of air or by heating sulfide ores such as pyrite um, in an excess of air. So um, the way which we can do this by burning sulfur in an excess of air um, is if we take sulfur gas, so S2, and we burn that in oxygen, so O2, we can then, um, that can then help us to produce um, sulfur dioxide. Um, and then our other method um, is using the sulfide ores like pyrite. So we can use a ratio of 4 to 11 of um, FeS2 um, to oxygen. And then that can produce a ratio of 2 to 8 or 1 to 4 of um, Fe2O3 and um, our sulfur dioxide. And so in either case, an excess of air is or oxygen is going to be used um, so that the sulfur dioxide which is produced is already then mixed in with oxygen, which can then be used for the next stage of the reaction, which is obviously making then the sulfur trioxide. So our next part of the process is then converting the sulfur dioxide into sulfur trioxide. And so this is um, an equilibrium reversible reaction. So we can apply Le Chatelier's principles concepts to this. And so um, the formation of sulfur trioxide is also an exothermic reaction. And so we use a vanadium oxide catalyst here as well in order to improve and increase the rate of conversion. So um, this reaction um, goes in a um, reaction of um, sulfur dioxide, a ratio of 2 to 1 of sulfur dioxide to oxygen. However, we can use excess oxygen gas because it can just be atmospheric oxygen. Um, and then that will produce um, the sulfur trioxide in a ratio of 2 to 1 to 2 of sulfur dioxide to oxygen to sulfur trioxide. And as said before, this reaction will also give off heat because it is an exothermic reaction. And so our delta H value for this would be negative. And so for this particular reaction, the delta H value is actually negative 196 kilojoules per mole. However, you don't need to remember this for um, the exam. That just helps to show that it's an exothermic reaction. Um, and so we then, after doing this, need to convert the sulfur trioxide into sulfuric acid. And so um, this simply can't just be done by adding water to the sulfur trioxide because the reaction would be so uncontrollable that it would create um, fog of sulfuric acid and it would be like a sulfuric acid gas um, instead of um, the concentrated sulfuric acid. And so the sulfur trioxide is first dissolved into concentrated sulfuric acid um, to create what we call oleum. And so this is done in a reaction where we take sulfuric acid and we add it to sulfur trioxide to then make fuming sulfuric acid, which is liquid sulfuric acid, um, which is called oleum. And so this can then be safely reacted with water to then produce the concentrated sulfuric acid, which is twice as much as you originally used to make the fuming sulfuric acid or the oleum. And so you're basically then doubling the reaction um, like product and doubling the efficiency. And so this um, then goes as oleum 
plus water, which will make a ratio of 1 to 2 of oleum to sulfuric acid. And so that sulfuric acid will be as a liquid. And so when we consider the reaction conditions for the contact process, uh, we need to consider the proportions of sulfur dioxide and oxygen. So the mixture of sulfur dioxide and oxygen going into the reactor is going to be in equal proportions um, by volume. And so this is because um, we then relate this back to Avogadro's law again, which says that equal volumes of gases at the same temperature and pressure are going to contain equal numbers of molecules. And so this basically means that the gases are going into the reactor in a ratio of one molecule of sulfur dioxide to one um, molecule of oxygen. And so that's gonna, there's going to be an excess of oxygen relative to the proportions demanded by the equation anyways, because we're using atmospheric oxygen as air. So um, that basically means that we only need to use the nece like necessities of sulfur dioxide whilst we have as much oxygen available for the reaction as we need. And so that's for the first step of the process. And then, um, so for the next part of the process, um, we need to then consider um, how we can apply Le Chatelier's principle to this, because Le Chatelier's principle can then help us to maximize the rate of the reaction, because this is a reversible reaction. So according to Le Chatelier's principle, Increasing the concentration of oxygen in the mixture causes the position of equilibrium to shift towards the right. And so this is because um, we have um, increasing the concentration of reactants forces the reaction to the right to make more products. And so since the oxygen comes from the air, this is a very cheap way of increasing the concentration of sulfur dioxide into sulfur trioxide because if we're performing this reaction in an excess of oxygen, we obviously have continuous supply of oxygen concentration into this. So it's very inexpensive to increase that rate of reaction. And so we could consider why not use an even higher proportion of oxygen? Why not make it extremely concentrated? And so this is very easy to see if you take an extreme case. So like supposing if you have a million molecules of oxygen, to every molecule of sulfur dioxide. And so the equilibrium is going to be very tipped strongly towards um, producing sulfur trioxide because virtually every single molecule of sulfur dioxide will be converted into sulfur trioxide. And so this sounds great, but you aren't going to produce much sulfur trioxide every day um, because the vast majority of what you are passing over the catalyst is oxygen. And so if you're putting mostly just oxygen over the catalyst, it's not actually going to have any sulfur dioxide to react with. And so nothing's actually going to be produced. And so by increasing the proportion of oxygen, you can obviously increase the percentage of sulfur dioxide converted. But at the same time, you can also decrease the to total amount of sulfur trioxide, which is made each day. And so the one to one mixture turns out to actually then give the best possible overall yield of sulfur, of sulfur trioxide. And so hence why the one-to-one -one ratio is preferred as opposed to that extreme ratio. Um, so next we need to consider the temperature for this reaction with an equilibrium consideration, but also with a rate consideration, and then the compromise which we come to. So you need to shift the position of the equilibrium as far possible to the right in order to maximize the possible amount of sulfur trioxide in the equilibrium mixture. And so the forward reaction or the production of sulfur trioxide we know is an exothermic reaction because it has that negative delta H value. And so according to Le Chatelier's principle, we know that the rate of reaction of an exothermic reaction will be favoured if you lower the temperature. And so we remember this is because in an exothermic reaction, 
heat is being produced. So we consider heat to be like a product. So if we're taking heat out of a system or taking product out of a system, in the case of taking heat out, it's like cooling the system down. And so if we were to take product out, we would force the reaction in the forward direction to replace product that is lost and hence producing more heat to counteract that change. And so in order to get as much sulfur trioxide as possible in the equilibrium mixture, you need as low of a temperature as possible. Um, but we want to use, again, like in our previous um, situation where we looked at the, con uh, at the harbour process, we want to use a temperature that is 400 to 450 degrees Celsius, which we know we don't consider to be a low temperature. However, industrially, that's considered a low temperature due to the reaction's um, rate of reaction. And so we remember the lower the temperature you use, the slower the reaction becomes. And so the manufacturer wants to try and produce as much sulfur trioxide as possible per day. So it makes no sense to try and achieve an equilibrium mixture, which contains a very high proportion of sulfur trioxide, if it's going to take, again, several years to achieve that equilibrium. And so in order to have the gases reach equilibrium within a very short amount of time, whilst maximising that um, forward reaction and maximising the amount of sulfur trioxide produced in that equilibrium mixture, um, you'll need the gases to reach the equilibrium in a short amount of time so that they can be in contact with the catalyst in the reactor. So the compromise for this is producing a reaction at 400 to 450 degrees Celsius, which is our compromise temperature to then produce a fairly high proportion of sulfur trioxide in the equilibrium mixture, but also then in a very short amount of time. We also then need to consider the pressure which will be used for this system. And so the pressure which is used for this system is um, going to be based on that there is three molecules on the left side of the um, equation, but only two on the right. And so according to Le Chatelier's principle, we can, rem we can remember and recall that if you are increasing the pressure of the system, it's going to respond by favouring the side of the reaction, which has the least moles of gas. So we've got three on the left hand side and two on the right. We want to increase the pressure of this system so that it favours the right side of the reaction where the products are located because the gas wants to take up the side with the least moles of gas um, because there is less space due to the higher pressure. And so in order to get um, as much sulfur trioxide as possible in the equilibrium mixture, you need as high pressure as possible. Because we remember high pressures can also increase the rate of reaction. However, this reaction is actually done at pressures close to atmospheric pressure. And so you may wonder, why would we use atmospheric pressure if we want to maximise the rate of reaction and the equilibrium concentration? And so this is because of an economic consideration. So even at very low pressures, there is a 99.5% conversion rate of sulfur dioxide into sulfur trioxide. And so the very small improvement that you could achieve by increasing the pressure of the system just isn't worth the expense of producing those high pressures. So hence, we settle with atmospheric pressure at which you don't need to actually apply any um, pressure to the system. Finally, we need to consider the catalyst which is used for this system. So um, this is going to consider both the equilibrium and the rate of reaction. So we know that um, the catalyst is going to have no effect whatsoever on our position of equilibrium. However, we do know that adding a catalyst um, is going to speed up the rate at which that equilibrium is achieved. 
We know it's not going to produce any greater percentage of sulfur trioxide in the equilibrium mixture, but if we do achieve that equilibrium quicker, we can obviously then go on to produce more um, if we're doing it at a faster rate. Um, however, when we consider rate, um, in the absence of a catalyst, this reaction is basically so slow that virtually no reaction is going to happen in any sensible time. So the catalyst is going to ensure that the reaction is fast enough for a dynamic equilibrium to be set up within a very short amount of time so that the gases are actually reactive in the reactor. And so this is the reason why we then use our vanadium oxide catalyst. So that's our production of sulfuric acid. So now we're going to go on to talk about the production of ethanol and biodiesel. So first of all, we're going to look at the production of biodiesel. So biodiesel is the process of producing um, what we otherwise know as bio, biofuel or biodiesel through the chemical reactions of either trans esterification and esterification. So this can either be done by using vegetable or animal fats and oils and reacting these with short chain alcohols. So short chain alcohols being something like methanol or ethanol. Typically, um, this will be yeah, no longer than ethanol. Um, and so the alcohols should be used, should be of a very low molecular weight. So ethanol is typically the most commonly used one um, because it's of low cost. However, greater conversions can be achieved um, if we're to use methanol for this particular reaction. So there is that conflict between choosing methanol and choosing ethanol. However, ethanol is typically used as it is more low cost. Um, and so the trans esterification reaction be, can be catalyzed through either acids or bases, um, whereas we have a base catalyzed reaction, which is our most common version. And so um, that's because the base catalyzed reaction has a lower reaction time um, and the catalyst cost is going to be lower um, for the base catalyzed version as well um, compared to those of acid catalysis. Um, however, there are some disadvantages of using the base catalyzed process and so that's because alkaline catalysis um, has high sensitivity to both water um, and also any free fatty acids which are present in the oils. And so in our base catalyzed method, we'll typically use um, a base such as sodium hydroxide, so NaOH, and so that will help us to catalyze this reaction. Um, and so common feedstocks which are used in the biodiesel production um, include what we know as yellow grease, so that's like a recycled vegetable oil. Um, then just like other vegetable oils and tallow may also be used. And so the recycled oil then gets processed to remove any impurities um, or any like burnt parts um, from cooking, storage, handling, etc. Um, and basically um, just make sure that there's no um, impurities such as dirt or water in there. Um, and so then this is refined um, and the phospholipids and any other plant matters um, are removed through refinement processes. And then water is also um, removed as well because um, during the base catalyzed trans esterification reaction, as we mentioned before, um, this would result in saponification, which is the pr process of making soap. And so that's a hydrolysis reaction. Um, of triglycerides and that's also base catalyzed process so if we were to put triglycerides and water together with the sodium hydroxide we would accidentally produce soap um, and glycerol instead of producing the biodiesel and glycerol and so that would obviously not be um, the process which we are wanting and so a sample of the clean feedstock um, also is tested via titration um, against a standardized base solution to determine the concentration of free fatty acids which are present in the vegetable oil.
Um, and so these acids are then removed, um, typically through a neutralization reaction um, or, or are esterified in order to produce um, biodiesel or glycerides. And so um, we can see um, on this, um, the reactions which we use, um, um, as shown on the screen here, um, we've got the base catalyzed reaction um, and the acid catalyzed reaction would undergo the same process. So we start off with our triglyceride, which is a three chain molecule connected through this carbon backbone. And we add that to a ratio of one to three of either methanol or ethanol. And then we combine that with our catalyst, which is sodium hydroxide, typically in our base catalyzed method. And that will produce three fatty esters, which are the biodiesel and glycerol, which is our byproduct. And so um, these typically are going to produce um, biodiesel and our impure co-product, which is glycerol. Um, and so if this has a high acid content, um, the acid catalyzed esterification can be used to react the fatty acids with the alcohol to use biodiesel. Um, but we can also use other methods such as fixed bed reactors, um, supercritical reactors or ultrasonic reactors um, to forego or decrease the use of catalysts. So that base catalyzed or um, acid catalyzed method, but we won't discuss those methods today. Um, we also have the lipase catalyzed method, um, but the lipase catalyzed method is not used as commonly. Um, but oftenly, um, often there has been large um, amounts of research focused into this because it uses um, enzymes as a catalyst for the transesterification reaction. And so researchers have found that um, very good yields can be obtained from using um, from crude and using oils with lipases. And so the use of lipases, which are a enzyme which breaks down fats, um, can make the reaction less sensitive to high free fatty acid content and water as well, which is a problem with the standard biodiesel process. So one problem with the lipase reaction though, is that methanol cannot be used because it will inactivate the lipase catalyst after only one batch. However, if methyl acetate is used um, instead of methanol, the lipase is not inactivated and so can then be used for several batches, which makes the lipase system a lot more cost effective. And so now we're just going to talk a little bit about what biodiesel is um, in terms of why it's used. So basically it is um, an alternative, an investigated alternative for um, providing a carbon neutral fuel source for powering vehicles. And so basically it's using recycled feedstocks um, and no longer used oils to then go on to produce a fuel which can be used to power um, rail engines, cars and factories. However, um, it does have its issues um, in that it can easily clog um, fuel filters um, and it's hard to purify. Um, it's also not completely green as it's also producing atmospheric carbon, um, but it's just not using oils um, that are being pulled out of the ground, instead using recycled oils. So it, although it does have its upsides, it does have its downsides as well. And in addition to this, it is quite expensive to produce, so the process does require further refining. Um, so now we're going to talk about the process of producing ethanol. So for producing ethanol, we have two main processes. Um, our first one, which we're going to look at, is called the hydration of ethene. So the hydration of um, alkenes is something which you've already looked at before um, in your organic chemistry topics. And so the hydration of alkenes um, can be applied to then making ethanol in an industrial application on a larger scale. And then we'll also look at the fermentation process to compare their um, similarities and differences. So the manufacturing of ethanol from ethene um, is used um, with steam and um, basically using a solid silicon dioxide um, catalyst, which is coated with phosphoric acid. 
And so this is a reversible reaction. So we can apply Le Chatelier's principles to this concept. Um, and it is done by, um, we can then also remove ethanol from the system in order to also like increase that reaction. And so when the gases from the reactor are actually cooled, um, the excess steam gets condensed and is then um, condensed with the ethanol. Um, and then the ethanol gets separated through distillation to then separate the ethanol from the water to create then the pure ethanol. So the conditions for this reaction, um, we need to first of all consider the proportions of ethene and steam. So the equation shows that ethene and water react in a one to one ratio. Um, and so in order to get this ratio, um, you would have to use basically just equal volumes of the two gases. Um, because, but because water is cheap, um, it would seem sensible to use an excess of steam in order to move the position of equilibrium to the right. Um, because according to Le Chatelier's principle, if you add more reactant, you're going to produce more product by forcing the reaction in the forward direction. Um, but in practice, an excess of ethene is actually used. And so this is um, very surprising um, at first thought, because even if the reaction is going one way, you couldn't possibly convert all of the ethene into ethanol, um, and because there just still isn't enough steam to react with it. But the reason for this strangeness is that the, um, it lies within the nature of the catalyst. And so that's because we're using that phosphoric acid catalyst, which is coated onto a solid silicon dioxide support. And so if you use too much steam, um, it dilutes the catalyst and it can even wash it off. So it basically then just makes the catalyst useless and hence obviously not increasing the rate or the yield of the reaction at all. So next we need to consider the temperature for the reaction. And so again, with the temperature for the reaction, we need to consider both equilibrium considerations, but also rate considerations. So when considering the equilibrium considerations, we want to shift the position of equilibrium as far possible to the right in order to produce the maximum possible amount of ethanol in the equilibrium mixture. And so this is because the forward reaction um, of this is going to be exothermic. So we know with exothermic reactions, heat is produced from the reaction. And so we treat heat like it is a product. So according to Le Chatelier's principle, if we were to increase the temperature, we would favor reactants. If we were to decrease the temperature, we would favor the products. And so we want to favor the products. So we should decrease the temperature in order to produce more heat by counteracting the system and then giving us as much ethanol as possible. So we want to use as low of a temperature as possible for this reaction. However, you can see on the screen here, we're using a 300 degrees Celsius for this reaction. And so yet again, like we've spoken about previously, 300 degrees Celsius isn't a particularly low temperature. However, we know that the lower the temperature you use, the slower the rate of the reaction becomes. And so if the, we know if the manufacturer is trying to make as much ethanol as possible per day, it makes no sense to try and achieve an equilibrium mixture that contains a very high proportion of ethanol if it's gonna take a very long time to produce that. So we come up with our compromise where we then um, use the 300 degrees Celsius um, in order for the gases to then um, achieve equilibrium. And so in under these conditions, um, about 5% of the ethene reacts to give ethanol at each pass of the catalyst. So we can see that that's a fairly ineffective method, but it's the best they can sort of get out of this method. So next we need to consider the pressure for this reaction. So you can notice that there are two molecules on the left hand side of the reaction, but only one on the right. And so this is because according to Le Chatelier's principle, if you increase the pressure of the system, it will respond by favoring the reaction which produces, produces fewer molecules. And so then obviously causing the pressure to fall again. And so in order to get as much ethanol as possible in the equilibrium, pressure, um, equilibrium system, 
you need as high pressure as possible um, because we know that high pressures um, will favor that forward reaction. We also know that high pressures increase the rate of reaction due to their relation with temperature and the ideal gas laws. However, the pressure that we use for this reaction, we can see is 60 atmospheres, and that's not a very high pressure. And so that's because there's two separate problems with this. So first of all, it's that the high pressures are expensive, and so it's gonna cost more to build the original plant if you use extremely strong pipes and containment vessels, and it also uses a lot of energy to produce those high pressures, which would make the ethanol very uneconomic to produce, considering we talked about before that, there, that there's only a 5% conversion rate of this reaction. We also need to consider that at very high pressures, ethene polymerizes, which means that it makes a very, very long chain molecule, which is called polyethene, which you may have heard of. And so apart from wasting the ethene, which could be made into ethanol, it's also clogging up the plant with these big solid masses, which are not producing what wants to be produced and hence is just making a mess and actually could cause um, damage to the plant. Finally, we need to consider the catalyst. So there's um, the rate considerations for this catalyst. So in the absence of a catalyst in this reaction, it would, be, it would be so virtually slow that no reaction would occur in a sensible, sensible amount of time. And so this is because we are trying to react ethene with water and we know ethene is a very unreactive molecule as it is a type of alkene. It is purely just made up of carbon bonded to hydrogen. So that's quite unreactive. We know water is also fairly unreactive. So we do need that phosphoric acid catalyst um, in order to then um, ensure that the dynamic equilibrium can be set up within a short amount of time so that the gases are actually reacted in the reactor. And so other alcohols can also be made from other different alkenes, but in the case of this, we're purely just looking at the hydration of ethene. And so that summarizes the process of the hydration of ethene. Um, we now want to look at ethanol though, um, produced by fermentation. And so ethanol by fermentation is only going to apply to ethanol. So unlike the process which we just looked at before, um, you can only make ethanol with this process, no other alcohols. And so the starting process varies widely for this, but typically it's going to start off with some sort of starchy plant material, um, typically like corn, wheat, barley, potatoes. And basically um, it's using complex carbohydrates to break them down into, um, so like our polysaccharides, to break them down into glucose. So we can see that's our first step here of the process where we're breaking down this complex polysaccharide into glucose. And so you don't need to worry about remembering that part of the process. That's just to show that we're starting off with something more complex in order to use it to make this glucose. And so this uses enzymes just to break it down into simpler parts. And so what happens in this reaction is this part of the reaction is what you do need to remember is the part at the bottom. Um, but basically ethanol via fermentation um, is the process in which we convert glucose to ethanol and carbon dioxide by fermenting it um, in what we see here in this kind of type setup. And so a few important notes which we need to make about this is that the pH of the water um, which we are performing this reaction in, needs to be neutral so that the yeast catalyst, which we use, which is going to be enzymes, um, are not denatured. And so yeast is going to be, or any other microscopic organism that does um, fermentation processes, needs to be present and contain the necessary enzymes in order to catalyze this reaction. Another important point is that this must occur at low oxygen concentration. And so this is because um, oxygen will prevent fermentation from occurring and yeast acts in low oxygen environments. So we need to ensure that it's um, closed off from high oxygen amounts. We also need to have glucose or any other similar um, type reactants for the yeast to break down to also use as energy.
in order to catalyze the reaction. We also need warm-ish temperatures, so like around 37 degrees Celsius, um, depending on the yeast or catalyst which is used. Um, but it would typically be around 37 degrees Celsius, which is our body temperature, um, because that's the rate at which many organic um, enzymatic reactions occur, because that's in the enzymes, um, in like the enzymes ideal um, sort of temperatures and its ideal reaction range. And so the alcohol produced from this type of reaction um, will actually only reach a concentration of about 14%. So in order to then achieve a higher concentration than this, you've got to then distill the um, alcohol. So we can see in this diagram here, the reaction occurs and then we put it through the condenser to then distill it um, into our graduated cylinder down the bottom here. So that's the process of producing ethanol via fermentation. Um, and so when we can produce ethanol via either hydration or fermentation, we can then come to the conclusion that um, producing ethanol via hydration is often our more efficient process and um, is a lot more effective just overall in terms of its rate of reaction. However, ethanol via fermentation is going to be a lot greener compared to hydration. And so um, even though ethanol by fermentation is typically not used as it occurs so slowly, um, there, are, there is research into looking at improving its method. So now we're going to finish off by looking at some concepts surrounding industrial chemistry. Um, and so with industrial chemistry, the products of the chemical industry can be divided into sort of three main categories. And so this is basic chemicals, specialty chemicals, and consumer chemicals. So basic chemicals are divided into chemicals derived from oil, known as petrochemicals, um, polymers, and basic inorganics. So petrochemicals um, are, is a bit misleading because it's the same as chemicals that are being increasingly derived from sources other than oil, such as like coal and biomass. And so an example is like methanol, which is commonly produced from oil and gas, but increasingly also from biomass. Um, and then so we've also got our basic chemicals. So basic chemicals are produced in large quantities and are just mainly sold within the chemical industry and to other chemical industries before becoming products for the general consumer. And so example like ethanoic acid being sold to make esters, which can then be used to make paints and then sold to the consumer. Um, then also like huge quantities of ethene, which are transported as gas to make polyethene and other polymers to then be used as plastics. Um, our next one, which we look at is petrochemicals and polymers. So the production of chemicals from petroleum um, and increasingly coal and biomass too, um, has basically seen many technological changes um, and the development of very large production sites. So the hydrocarbons in crude oil and gas, um, which are mainly straight chain alkanes, um, are the first different um, are separated and that uses their boiling points. And so, and they're like differences in boiling point. And so this can be done using distillation. And they're then converted into hydrocarbons, which are going to be more useful to the chemical industry. Um, so these are going to be like branch chain alkanes, alkenes, and aromatic hydrocarbons. And so these processes then just um, like used to then determine, um, just to then convert the hydrocarbons into various basic chemicals, which can be used to so like petrol, ethanol, um, and those types of things, which can then be put into further reactions to make more useful end products. So like, for example, using phenol to make resins, ammonia to make fertilizers and that sort of thing. And so um, the main use for petrochemicals is basically just the manufacturing of a wide range of polymers. Um, so next we also have basic inorganics. So these are relatively low cost um, and used throughout manufacturing and agriculture. And so they produce these in quite large amounts um, 
and these things include things like chlorine, sodium hydroxide, sulfuric acid, nitric acid, and the certain chemicals for fertilizers. And so as well as petrochemicals, um, many countries are also finding ways to make them cheaper. Um, and so also um, meeting safety standards and environmental standards by using um, biomass to make these. And then there's also the specialty chemicals. And so this category is covering a wide range of chemicals for like crop protection, paints, inks, colorants. Um, and it also includes chemicals used by industries um, such as like textiles, paper um, and engineering. Um, so these are basically just talking about new products which are being created to meet both like customer needs and new environmental regulations. And so an example is like everyday household paints, which have um, evolved from being like solvent based to now being water based or like the latest ink developments for inkjet printers. And so finally, we've got the consumer chemicals. And so these are the ones which are sold directly to the public. And so this is things like detergents, soaps um, and other toiletries. So um, that's where we're looking at our concepts of like saponification, where we use the triglycerides um, and react them with water in that hydrolysis reaction in order to make soap. And so that's just an example of one of those type processes. So a summary of what we've gone through today um, is that um, we looked at analytical techniques um, and how we can learn about all those processes to apply them to then determining the structure and function of organic materials. We also looked at the harbour process and the contact process. And then we looked at biodiesel and ethanol production. Um, and then we finished up by looking at industrial chemistry and why it is important to, um, to have these processes in place um, for making these products for everyday use. And so just a few reminders before we finish up and a few top tips. So you want to, um, I would say it's a good idea to memorize important processes and reaction conditions from what we went through today, because most of these will not be covered in the data booklet. Um, it's also too important to remember the analytical techniques, when they can be applied and how to use them. Um, and it's also good to um, compare the concepts of biodiesel and eth um, ethanol production and consider the green chemistry principles surrounding this in industrial applications. So thank you very much for watching everyone and good luck with your end of year exams and the rest of year 12.